I'm also going to kick off the uh, live stream. Uh, so we're going to be broadcasting now on asksbdc.com, uh, which we do every Monday and Wednesday. So that's broadcasting now. So Chris, uh, why don't you uh, take, uh, take us away? Absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly Monday and Wednesday um, outward facing call. Um, as my friend Scott calls it, it's a call where we are here um, for those folks that are looking for questions and answers and access to resources and tools to support them um, during this coronavirus pandemic that we're dealing with today. Um, I wanted to mention that this is our 40th year um, um, bringing the services and the tools and the resources to entrepreneurs and small businesses. Um, SBDC is a national organization. Um, we are here to provide, as I said, tools, resources, and information for folks that are um, entrepreneurs, small businesses, um, and, and just needing access and support with your business venture. Um, this presentation that we're doing, this webinar, it's our small business town hall, um, disaster relief loan updates. Um, it's presented to you um, through the Finance Center, and we are a subdivision of NorCal SBDC um, Network. This is our 53rd session, and we are all in this together. All right, so there we go. Um, what I wanted to do is just kind of give a, a general overview, making some introductions. Um, as I said, you know, Northern California Small Business Development Center, um, supported by SBA. We are funded, federally funded by SBA. Um, we are the consulting arm of SBA. So we are the largest consulting firm in the country. Um, the services that we bring to you are complimentary, um, no cost to you. We um, offer a variety of different services, a variety of different tools and resources. We do one-on-one -on -one consulting, we do webinars, we do workshops, we do education events as well. Um, and as I said, all of this comes to you um, complimentary. We are also funded um, through the state as well, through the governor's office, through GoBiz. Um, GoBiz is the governor's office of economic development. And again, all of the services and the tools and resources from SBDC are all complimentary to you. Um, the Finance Center, the Finance Center is a subdivision of the Northern California SBDC network, um, specialized in getting loans for small businesses. Um, you have um, normally presenting this to you would be our director, Scott Rodowski, um, and our associate director, Sunita, Sunita Mahara. Um, as Alan said, my name is Chris Horton, and I'm a lending specialist for the Finance Center team. Um, I wanted to share with you the territory that we cover. Um, we cover from the Oregon border down to Santa Cruz. We cover the nine um, counties of the Bay Area. Um, we also go southeast into Stockton, Nevada, and then back up to the Oregon border. So really large territory that we cover. Um, but if you wanted to find a center that's local and close to you, you can just go online or you can contact us at the um, SBDC um, call center. So we have that information that will be made available to you on the website as well. Or should I say not website, but on the um, presentation. On the agenda today, we're going to have our disclaimer, which definitely keeps us out of hot water and um, keeps us transparent as well. We're going to cover the EIDL, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. We're going to also cover the PPP, some parameters there. PPP, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, the Paycheck Protection Forgiveness Documents, we'll cover that today as well. We will talk about the PPP Forgiveness Reductions, um, covering payroll and non-payroll. Um, we would have normally had an SBA update, but SBA uh, will not be joining us today, so we won't have an actual SBA update. Um, we'll discuss some upcoming webinars that we have, some great information available to you. Um, and then we'll be joined today um, by our friends from Case Force. It's an attorney coalition 
that will be able to um, answer some of your questions that you have um, regarding um, legal matters. And then we'll jump into a Q&A. So we'll have an opportunity to answer questions as well. Here we go. So our disclaimer. Uh, many of you know this already, but things are, ch are, are constantly changing. You know, there are different moder um, modifications, adjustments um, that are made to um, the programs, the disaster relief efforts that are out there. So when um, we put this um, presentation together, the information that we're presenting now um, was correct when the um, presentation was actually put together. So um, if I say something today and this afternoon it's different, um, we are just preparing you that that can happen. And it's just a matter of, um, I, I take it as that the programs are looking to evolve to be um, more supportive of the business community and the pandemics that we're dealing with. So they're constantly trying to make things better for folks. Um, the PPP, the PPP program expired on August the 8th. Um, I know many of the lenders that still had applications in the queue after the 8th, they had 10 days to get those loans um, completely funded through SBA. So today being the 19th, that would have expired yesterday. Um, but that program has come to a close. Um, we have not received any word just yet. Um, if it's going to come back, if it's going to be extended, there's a lot of discussion happening, but we don't have anything concrete that we can um, provide. Um, we just want to continue um, staying, staying in communication, and as we learn it, then we'll bring it to you as well. The EIDL, has, um, it's still open. It's open to um, all industries. I know at one point it had shut down and then opened back up and it was only available for the agricultural industry. And then they opened it up to all business industries. So EIDL, they're still funding there. If you've not applied, we definitely encourage you to apply. Don't know, um, um, there's no magic to it and there's no crystal ball for us to tell you if you will get approved, if you won't get approved, but there's no reason for you to, um, uh, not pursue that and explore that option because it may be um, a line to some resources that can help you out. Um, some industries that we want to make certain folks know or organization structures that we want to make certain folks know are available and eligible are 501c3, 501c4s, and 501c6 as well. Um, there is no more EIDL advanced the ideal advance was when you could go online, complete an application, and there was a box that you would check that said you wanted to be considered for up to $10,000, but they exhausted those funds and there are no more advance, but the application for the actual EIDL loan itself is still available. Um, and again, yeah, just want to re reiterate to not hesitate to apply for that. You don't know how long the program is going to be around, but you definitely want to make certain that you take advantage of it and at least explore, explore to see if you can qualify for that. There are some fine print at the bottom of the um, slide there that you can read into for more detail, but I think we covered the gist of what we wanted to get covered in the disclaimers. So here we go. We're going to take a look at um, some of the parameters. I am going to move this out of my way. There we go. So that I can see it. So first we'll start with the EIDL. So the interest rate on the EIDL, the interest rate is 2.75% um, for nonprofits. It's 3.75% for profit um, organizations and businesses. The term of the loan is 30 years. It's 30 years across the board for all nonprofits and for profit businesses. Um, there is an 11 month deferral period. Um, during those 11 months, interest will accrue. So if you are a nonprofit, interest will accrue at 2.75%. And if you're for profit, interest will accrue at 3.75%. Um, collateral for EIDL. Um, collateral for is required for um, loans above $25,000. So if your loan is less than $25,000, there's no collateral requirement. Um, and personal guarantees are for loans that are greater than $200,000. Um, the EIDL is not a forgivable. It is a, um, it is a recourse loan, which basically means that you're borrowing money that you are promising to pay back. 
30 year term to do that. There are no prepayment penalties or things improve for you and you're able to repay it sooner rather than later, you're definitely able to do something like that. Um, the use of the proceeds on how you're allowed to spend the money on all operating expenses, um, the cost of goods sold, um, and any interest debt payments is what you can use it for. Um, so you can't use it because we're in a disaster environment, but it's not looked favorable for you to be using the EIDL funds for business expansion, um, purchasing equipment, or paying off any existing loans that you have or any satisfying any tax loans that you have. So that's not looked favorable on um, PPP, Paycheck Protection. Chris, before you go, I just want to make, be clear that, that question of paying off uh, existing loans, you can pay off the standard in monthly interest payments from sure. a loan, but you can't use it to pay off uh, principal. That's absolutely. absolutely. Thanks for that, Alan. Um, PPP. So the interest rate on PPP, it's a 1% interest rate um, on those loans. It's um, the term of the loan is two or five years, and that's really depending upon when you apply for the PPP, when it originally um, was made available to the public. It was a two year, um, and then they revised the program when they bought it back and then um, gave a five year term. So depending on when you apply and what you and your lender have agreed to will determine that term that you have. Uh, there's a 10 month um, deferment on the PPP loan after your covered period expires. Covered period originally um, eight weeks, new covered period 24 weeks, but when that covered period ends, based on when your funds were dispersed, will determine, um, that will determine when the 10 months get started for you. Um, there is no collateral, neither is there any personal guarantees required on the PPP loan. Um, yes, the PPP is forgivable. Um, there are parameters that you wanna follow, which is what's just below, it says 60% or more of payroll costs. Um, so the money that you receive, 60% of it should cover payroll costs minimum, that's not a hard number, but the minimum requirement to be considered for forgiveness is that 60% was used on payroll costs. That can include state taxes. Um, the remaining 40% can be used on utilities, mortgage interest, monthly payments, and rent. So hypothetically, you got a $100,000, um, you got a $100,000 loan, 60% um, 60 would be $60,000 of that would be used on payroll. The remaining 40% of that can be used on utilities, mortgage interest, monthly payments, and rent. Um, what's not allowed for PPP funds would be workman's comp, paying federal taxes, anything that is not part of the four uses, um, rent, utility, um, payroll, and interest, or payments and interest. Let's see. Required documentation for PPP, so PPP loan forgiveness calculation form is a required form. That's page three of the application. You have the PPP schedule A, which is page four of the application. Here we've provided a couple of links for you. Um, the first one is where you can obtain the actual application. And then the second link is where you can get the instructions um, for completing the application. So now we'll dive into PPP loan forgiveness regarding reduction, the loan forgiveness reduction. So first, a business may exclude any reduction in FTE, full-time equivalent employees, if the borrower is able to document in good faith the following inability to, one, rehire individuals who were employees on February 15, 2020, and two, hire similarly qualified persons for unfilled positions on or before December 31st of 2020. Employers must report situation to EDD within 30 days and keep written offer to rehire, rejection of offer, and efforts to hire a similarly qualified person. For purposes of calculating the loan forgiveness reduction required for salary or hourly wage reductions in excess of 25% for certain employees, 
all forms of compensation included or only salaries and wages. Only take into account decreases in salaries or hourly wages. If a borrower does not pay biweekly or more frequently, then it will need to calculate payroll costs for partial pay periods. The covered period for all ends December 31st of 2020. For purposes of, so now we're gonna talk about loan forgiveness for payroll costs. For purposes of calculating cash compensation, the gross amount should be used when calculating and not the net amount. Payroll costs include all forms of cash compensation paid to employees, including tips, commissions, bonuses, and hazard pay. Cash compensation per employee is still limited to $100,000. Amount of compensation of owners, employees, that is eligible for forgiveness depends on the business type and whether the borrower is using an eight or 24 week covered period. For eight weeks, the max is 15,385,000. ,000, and for 24 week, weeks, the max is 20,833. For more detailed information, the forgiveness document will be located in the chat. So that'll be our great friend, Alan, helping us out with that. And uh, I've already posted uh, both the application uh, and the instruction for the application uh, links to that, as well as link, a link to uh, where you can download today's presentation. Awesome, thanks, Alan. Um, loan forgiveness continuing for payroll costs. So healthcare and retirement costs, group healthcare benefits will be considered payroll costs employer expenses for employee group health that are paid or incurred during the cover period are eligible. Not eligible is the portion paid by the employees. Employer contributions for employee retirement benefits that are paid or incurred during the cover period are eligible. Not eligible is the portion paid by the employees or for accelerated from periods outside of the cover period. Loan forgiveness for non-payroll costs, eligible business mortgage interest costs, business rent or lease costs, and business utility costs incurred prior to the covered period and paid during the covered period are eligible for loan forgiveness. Non-payroll costs are eligible for loan forgiveness if they were incurred during the covered period and paid on or before the next regular billing date, even if that billing date is after the covered period. Payments of interest on business mortgages on real or personal property, such as an auto loan, are eligible for loan forgiveness. Interest on unsecured credit, not eligible for loan forgiveness because the loan is not secured by real or personal property. If a lease that existed prior to February 15, 2020, expires on or after February 15, 2020, and is renewed, the lease payments made pursuant to the renewed lease during the covered period are eligible for loan forgiveness. Similarly, if a mortgage loan on real or personal property that existed prior to February 15, 2020, is refinanced on or after February 15, 2020, the interest payments on the refinanced mortgage loan during the covered period are eligible for loan forgiveness. A service for distribution of transportation refers to transportation utility fees assessed by state and local governments. Payment of these fees by the borrower is eligible for loan forgiveness. For more detail, please go to the website below. And I'm sure Alan's gonna help us if he's not already done so by putting it in the chat for you. I'm just um, getting there, Chris. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So now we're at the part where um, SBA would have um, given an update. So I'm happy to kind of go over this here with you just to kind of make certain that you're um, aware of some of these um, parameters. But then also, you know, 
some of the information in regards to disaster, SBA disaster contact. So SBA loan support, um, something that's pretty exciting is that SBA will automatically pay the principal and interest of current fully funded 7A loans or 504 loans and micro loans for up to six months for you. Um, SBA will also automatically pay the principal and interest and fees of any new 7A 504 or micro loans as long as they're funded prior to September 27, 2020. So if you're um, looking for financing, this is something great to take advantage of during this crisis because you get the loan put in place and um, SBA will, um, if it's a new loan, SBA will cover six months. So that gives you um, a breather there to be able to generate some revenue to start picking up those loan payments after six months. Um, contact information for SBA disaster, you got the 800-659-2955. Um, you got the, if you want to send an email, you got disaster customer service at sba.gov is an option for you. Um, if you have applied for an EIDL loan, you were declined, you received a declination letter, um, and you worked with your SBA um, uh, loan officer or your SBDC advisor and you want to um, submit reconsideration, you um, can use the reconsideration email, which is P as in Paul, D as in David, C as in Charlie, recons with the apostrophe or with the plural for S, reconsiderations at sba.gov. So PDC, recons at sba.gov. Um, and then on servicing side um, for payments and things like that, you have the ELPASODLSC at sba.gov, or there's an 800 number that you can call into as well, which is 800 487 6019. Okay. Awesome. So that is your um, EIDL. PPP update. Um, that is who we are here at um, the Finance Center, um, what we bring to you from the um, NorCal SBDC network. You know, I share it with folks that we are here for you um, from inception to succession. So we want you to have an idea. Uh, we want to help you um, crystallize that business idea, that business venture. We want to then help support you through the different phases that businesses go through. And then we wanna help see that you are able to um, exit the business and um, leave a succession plan the way that you wanna have it done as well. So thank you for allowing me to present for you this morning in behalf, on behalf of Scott and Sunita. And um, I'll be here for the duration of the webinar. Thanks, Chris. And if, uh, Chris, if you could take a, a bit of time during that to, uh, while, while the, uh, attorneys are come, come, hitting the questions to you, hit the questions in the online piece, uh, maybe give any responses, and then we got, we'll have some time back. Uh, if there's anything you want to share publicly uh, with people, we can, we can come back to that. Uh, welcome, sure. Mike. Mike is uh, going to be uh, handling and triaging the questions uh, for our colleagues at Case Force. And quite quickly, before we do that, let me just uh, want to introduce three of them uh, who are with us. Uh, so we've got Kate Tyler. Uh, who was on and was uh, had a uh, oh there's, there's Kate hi Kate uh, Kate's a, a, a corporate uh, specialist corporate law specialist we've got Cooper Spinelli up there uh, he's a employment law specialist and uh, Maureen Lynch is a tax law specialist and Brett did you want to introduce them or introduce Case Force uh, at all uh, no just <clears throat> happy to be here uh, represent a consortium of uh, legal and other professionals where you have a resource guide available that provides county by county information on resources available to small businesses during the pandemic. I'll be sure to add a link to that in the chat window. Um, but I think we can we can take it away with any uh, questions that have come in so far. Thanks. So Mike, are you going to pick the questions out of the Q&A? And you might want to turn your mute off so that we can hear you. Let's try that one more time. I might be able to. There we go. How's that? We can hear you now, Mike. Yes, excellent. Excellent. All right. So I see that we had 
We had someone asking about PPP loan forgiveness and do we go through our lender, in my case, Wells Fargo, or use these SBA PPP forms and instructions that Alan linked in the chat? Um, the forms are all the same I and mean, you're gonna submit them through your lender, but these would be the forms that you would use. And it also asks when the PPP forgiveness begins. And it can begin now, but it would be, you know, subsequent to whenever your covered period ends. So if your loan period was before June 5th, you've got the choice of choosing eight weeks or 24 weeks. And so if it's 24 weeks, you would simply wait till the end of that period. If you're using eight weeks, you're probably already there. Right. Um, I get a feeling you've just joined us, so you probably can't see the questions that were submitted before that, can you? Before you joined us, can you? No, I cannot. All right then. Uh, then I'll I'll <laughs> I'll pretend to be you then, and uh, <laughs> I'll work that because I think that's going to make life uh, easier. So uh, we got a question uh, for Maureen. Um, I assume. That, well, let's just check this. It might might be more appropriate for another one of the attorneys, but it says Maureen. I have a couple of SBDC clients. I've had someone test positive with COVID. In talking to them, I find they were not aware that they should have had a COVID protocol plan. Uh, they've looked, but can can we recommend a simple description of what needs to be in such a plan? For example, when someone can return, is that you or maybe Cooper who might be better uh, for that? Definitely not me, because <laughs> I'm a federal tax expert, but <laughs> maybe Cooper can answer. And Alan, sorry about that. I think I missed the first part of your question. Um, so it's someone who's uh, had a couple of people who've tested positive, that where the, client, the clients where the clients have had uh, folks have tested positive, and they didn't have, they weren't even aware they should have had a COVID protocol plan. Uh, could, do we have a simple description of what needs to be in such a plan, uh, like for examples of when someone can return? Yes. Um, so, yeah, so if someone tests positive, of course, you, you're going to want to um, send them home and you'll want to identify and confidentially notify any employees who may have been exposed to that uh, person. Um, generally, if they've worked within six feet of the, the, six per, the, the person who tested positive for you know, any more than 10 minutes or if they've had unprotected direct contact with that person, um, uh, again, you want to, but you, you want to try to do this uh, uh, confidentially. For the employees who have tested positive, um, you've got to require that they stay at home, self-isolate. Uh, they shouldn't return to work until meeting three, all three of the following criteria. Okay, at least ten days have passed since symptoms have first appeared. At least three days have passed since recovery. Um, and that means you're know, having no fever without the, the use of fever reducing medications and the individual has improvement in respiratory systems. And that's, that's from the, the, the CDC. Um, and I guess, you know, depending on the circumstances, you need to assess whether you, you need to stop work at all. If you need to do a, a, a deep cleaning of the entire work, work, um, space, obviously you want to disinfect wherever that, uh, employee who test positive has has worked. Um, so those are the principal things you'd want to do. Thanks, thanks, Peter. But we also um, I'm going to put into the link into the chat a link to a webinar that our HR specialist did uh, a while back on bringing people back, and they covered some of the protocols and stuff that you need to have on there. Uh, so I'm, I, I put that in the in the chat. Uh, so there's a link where you can view that recording. Um, Okay, so this is, uh, I'm guessing for Kate, so it is legal corporate. Uh, as a franchisee, the franchisor is pivoting small businesses towards virtual gym classes and no brick and mortar gym. I'm concerned I will not be able to sell the business if the virtual, uh, if virtual business and memberships. My franchise agreement runs until 2023. Um, this is what should I be concerned, which I think she means should you be concerned, and thank you. Uh, Kate, any thoughts on that? Um, I think we, uh, someone would need to take a, oh, I see the question here. Thank you. Um, I, I believe that someone would need to take a look at the franchise agreement 
um, before weighing in on um, what concerns this person should have uh, with respect to selling the business. I mean, obviously the inability to, um, it doesn't take a review of the franchise agreement to understand that the inability to run the business out of the brick and mortar um, storefront is uh, going to compromise the business's resale value. But as far as what the uh, terms of the contract um, require around the sale, uh, I can't really speculate on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's so mark that one as done. So I'm looking for the next legal one. Um, uh, somebody wants to know is we're also having the 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Thursday attorney panel. No, this is it. Um, so um, no, no, we're not. Um, but, 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 but finding something else that's legal. Uh, that's that's okay. A legal a lease question. Uh, so I'm not sure if. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Kate, you might be able to handle this or not. Uh, uh, legal lease question. The landlord won't respond to reduce rent during the pandemic. What should I do when gross revenue is down 50% pre-pandemic? Um, unfortunately, I'm not a real estate attorney. However, um, I think that the common sense approach here um, would be to obviously try to have some good faith discussions with the landlord um, it also depends on what this particular person's county um, has done with respect to uh, eviction moratoriums. Um, and uh, I would also suggest maybe contacting the local rent board. Yeah, and we, we are having a, uh, a webinar tomorrow uh, on commercial leases. Uh, our colleagues at uh, Start Small Think Big are doing that and if i could just find the link to it there we go um i will that's the, that's the wrong one i i will throw the link to uh, the registration for that into the uh into the chat uh, in just a minute so uh we'll so you can register for that it's tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock um let me have a look see for any more legal pieces uh this might be one for um for Cooper, by the looks of things, we have an employee who we placed on a 14 day quarantine due to having been directly exposed to another individual, their parent, who tested positive. The individual is non exempt and not able to perform their work duties remotely. They used EPSL funds to cover the first 14 days, and none of the templates for EPSL documentation address this circumstance. How do they document that the individual is eligible for EPSL, not meeting? one of the five criteria, but now with the New York Federal Court judge having invalidated several of the FFCRA guidelines. Cooper, is that you? Yes, that is me. I was just trying to find uh, the question up here, Alan. It's towards the bottom. So I can read it, okay. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not seeing the question, but as I understand it is the, the employee has a family member who's tested positive and the employee who's not exempt uh, is quarantined or self-isolating for 14 days. And the question is whether that employee is eligible for um, uh, the EP, uh, EPSL. Yeah. And they want to know how to document that because it's not meeting one of the five criteria. Okay, and then also in light of the, I, I believe the mention of the um, the federal court in New York, yeah, in joining parts of the regulations. Okay, so so yeah, part of the part of the um, the injunction from the federal court of New York is that employers cannot use documentation as a precondition for leave. So they can still request documentation, but you can't use that as a reason for denying an otherwise eligible employee leave. So I'm not sure whether this employee is eligible for EPS, EPS, um, EPSL, but if they are a if they are the primary caregiver, I think for the for family member, parent, or child who's sick, um, who's tested positive for COVID, they I think they might be eligible. So I, I, again, I didn't see the the entire question, but. Um, 
if the question is what kind of document or if I don't know if the question is what documentation they could request or the documentation is inadequate or if the, the employer is certain that they are not eligible for EPSL. Yeah, it says uh, that I think they, they were eligible, uh, but they're saying that none of the templates for EPSL documentation address this particular circumstance is what their, their concern was. None of the templates. Okay, I'm not sure. So maybe the, the qualifying conditions, I'm not sure what they mean by templates, but even if they're not eligible um, and this person is, they can't work from home remotely, but they've requested some, you know, a leave uh, to, to care for their family member um, in that situation, you, know, you still want to go, you still want to talk with the person, see if they're eligible for EPSL. Again, I, I wouldn't advise against, um, you know, just generally speaking, given in light of the injunction, uh, requiring any sort of documentation as a precondition for leave, I wouldn't do that. Um, and it, it, in, even if that employee is not eligible for EPLSL, I think the, you know, just as best practices uh, provide him or her with um, some administrative leave. And, uh, uh, and kind of a follow-up on that from, from Joy, does that federal court ruling now apply in California? So that's still unclear. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, there's generally the, yeah, it's just not clear from the court's order. Um, you know, sometimes the courts have within the last few years have with increasing frequency issued, uh, district courts have issued nationwide injunctions. It's been some somewhat of a controversial practice, um, but it's not clear from the court's order. And so we still don't have information on that, but um, just as a, a best practice measure, uh, it would be safer to um, proceed as if it, it is a, it, it does have a nationwide effect. Thanks, Kuba. Um, so, quest so if you have questions to uh, uh, to share with our with our legal team, please uh, put them in the Q and A. I would ask if you put the word "legal" in capitals at the beginning. It'll make it much easier for us to find them. Um, we we don't have any outstanding oh one's just come in uh for uh for the tax attorney so i believe that's maureen um says uh, for the tax attorney, is there a state and federal resource that summarizes all available tax credits both pandemic and ordinary to small businesses for hiring employees i payroll tax credits Unfortunately, I don't think there is. Um, the IRS website is pretty good. It has a lot of information about the federal programs that are available. And I would just maybe check California's website if you're a California taxpayer, but I don't know of any resource that compiles everything. Thank you. Uh, we've got one from Dana, which is uh, says HR, which I'm guessing is probably for you, Cooper. Uh, we have an employee working reduced hours remotely uh, due to lower volume of the business. She may test positive for COVID. If she tests positive, is she still eligible for paid sick leave? Um, yes. Yeah, I mean, she tests, I mean, if she, especially if she's otherwise eligible for paid sick leave, but if, yeah, if she's test positive and she needs, then she needs to obviously to, to, um, to leave work and then self isolate at home. Um, then yeah, no, she would, she would be, um, eligible for, provided the other conditions are met. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have one, um, which I'm, guessing is probably sort of general corporate so i'm thinking it might be for uk uh it's about what is the liability for a business owner that is starting a new business so i.e a restaurant and the location being rented had all the restaurant equipment when they moved in can the previous restaurant owner come back and claim the restaurant equipment many restaurant owners that had to close business and break lease agreements left all the equipment landlords are now renting the locations with the equipment from a previous owners um well again i'm not a real estate attorney um so i i cannot give a complete answer to this question but it probably depends on a couple of things 
one of which is whether or not any of the equipment is considered a fixture in the restaurant. And it sounds like in this instance, it probably is not. Um, where, whereas fixtures would stay with the property. Um, another is what the lease with the prior tenant says the landlord can do with any abandoned equipment um, after a certain period of time. And if enough time has lapsed, then perhaps uh, the owner no longer has claim over it. So it would be good to know what that lease says. Yeah. Um, and I would suggest also the other thing, uh, having, having sat in on about a thousand of our restaurant program webinars, uh, reach out to uh, the, uh, through your local SPDC to our, to our restaurant program. Um, who have some specialists who can help you on, on that area as well. But like you said, it's all about what's on the lease, isn't it? Um, for that one. Okay, um, so that was that one. Thank you very much. Um, just one. Uh, so that's PPP, that's idle. Um, so Joy, uh, I put into the... Um, into the chat, a link to the uh, webinar that uh, we had that, uh, um, that Chana Anderson ran, where she covered some of that protocol stuff. Uh, and that would be the place to, to get that. Uh, but uh, Cooper, you've got a, an idea of where you might find a, a sample plan? Sure, I mean, not exactly a sample plan, Joy, but if you go to uh, Cal OSHA, they have industry specific guidance that includes recommendations uh, for workplace specific plan and I could send that, we could send that link in the chat. I mean, just, so just for example, for office workplaces, they have a guidance that includes work, work, workplace specific plan, topics for worker training, individual control measures and screening that employers can implement. And I'll just rattle off a few of the, the bullet points for the workplace specific plan. Um, you, you wanna establish a prevention plan for every office location that, that includes performing a comprehensive risk assessment of all the work areas and work tasks, incorporate uh, face covering and guidance into the workplace specific plan, identify contact information from the local health department, train and communicate with workers and worker representatives on the plan, regularly, uh, regularly evaluate the office workspace, investigate any COVID illness and determine if any work-related factors could contribute. And, and there's a few others, but I'll send around that link. So I think that's a good starting point. Great, thanks Cooper. Uh, so I'm not seeing anything else legal at the moment. Uh, let me just go down to the bottom. No, so I'm gonna, Start throwing some of these questions at, uh, at Chris now for the for the finance ones until we get some more legal ones in. Uh, so Chris, there's one for Maria. I've been advised by a funding source that the six month loan payment assistance would probably not apply to current or new 504 loan due to funding timing restrictions. Is there any talk about extending the September date? If not, who at the SBA will I put in a request for cons reconsideration? Yes, I, I can't say that we've had any um, conversation in regards to extending any dates just yet. Um, but if they want to um, follow up with us by contacting us through Ask, SB, um, Ask SBDC, we can definitely you know reach out and talk to someone at the district office. But as far as I know thus far, there's been no conversation or anything um, that has come down from Scott, Sunita, or any of our contacts at SBA about an extension. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I've got another one in from, uh, from, from one of your fellow uh, 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 advisors. Uh, Chris is claiming that business can apply for, uh, Chris, Chris is claiming that businesses can apply for an idle increase. How? Uh, I've only heard one or two clients region wide that have been successful in getting the a SBA to reconsider increase their idle loan amount yeah. after they made a mistake on the original application. I never heard of clients being able to ask for more money. Chris? Yeah, definitely you can do that um, where if you've been, if you've received funding and the amount of funding that you wanted wasn't sufficient enough or if the amount that you were approved for wasn't sufficient enough. So if you were to take a look at um, um, your revenue uh, minus your cost of goods sold, um, SBA approved you for a smaller amount, uh, a smaller amount than the six months that you would have um, you would have received. Then yes, you can write a reconsideration letter. I've helped a couple of folks write reconsideration letters where um, you know 
the calculation that was used on the back end with SBA um, was done incorrectly and they were able to get an increase on their EIDL loan. So it's a matter of you needing to give evidence to the dollar amount that you received and the calculation that was used, what you were approved for, um, and showing the economic injury that you need more money and they'll reconsider that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this one was sort of counts as legal. I've had several employees who have not come back and then I've rehired new people and they had to lay them off because PPP funds ran out. What do we need to do with the EDD for support uh, for support to the forgiveness. So I'm not sure if that's a, is that maybe that's a PPP forgiveness question as much as a legal one. So read the question again, Alan. So if I have several employees who have not come back and then I've rehired new people and then had to lay them off because the PPP funds ran out. Uh, what do we need to do with the EDD for support to this forgiveness? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So when you're talking about EDD for forgiveness, those are two different things there. So EDD is going to be addressing the non-return of those employees. And if those if um, those employees are actually looking to go get unemployment, you being able to have documentation that you have to let them go or they're no longer working, that's an EDD concern there. When you're talking about PPP forgiveness, your, your lender that did the loan with you, um, they're looking at basically the usage of the funds, um, the number of FTEs you had, um, they're looking at the, um, the 60-40 or the 75-25 um, breakdown. So I don't really think that those two jive together. Um, yeah. I think it would, it would make more sense for you to call in and actually have a conversation with someone so that we can talk through it and then kind of break peel back the different layers and what is it that you're really trying to solve here? Are you really trying to solve that you're trying to get forgiveness? Or are you really trying to solve something with EDD because of some sort of um, unemployment benefits um, um, that someone's trying to get? So I think your best advice, call in, talk to one of our advisors. Um, we also have an, um, an HR specialist that you would be able to talk to as well. Yeah, Chris, uh, could you scroll your, uh, scroll the screen a few? Uh, you've got the uh, the case force disclaimer up. If you scroll it to the last slide on there, we've got the ask oh, SPG you number. Saying, yeah, you're still sharing. So. And I have one thing to add to. If I heard you correctly, Alan, on the question, they had two things. They had that there were employees that weren't coming back to work that he tried to hire back. Is that the case at the beginning of that? Was that was part? Yes, that was part okay. of it for sure. So in that case, folks that um, refused to come back on after after the uh, HR 7010 went through, one of the exemptions for employers for having those FTEs excluded is if you have employees that refuse to come back, if they document the, the um, offer to the employees, like if they made it via email and those employees uh, declined to come back, they can be excluded from the FTE calculation for forgiveness. There is going to be a requirement that they would report that to EDD because if those people have refused to take their job back and are claiming unemployment income, that can be an issue. Yeah. So that, that's the first part of her question had to do with those folks that refuse to come back to work. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Um, and um, so Maureen, we've got one uh, in here from Bill. It's for the tax journey. Could you say something about the current issue of employee forward slash independent contractor debate? in terms of the tax liability a company might incur from improperly hiring someone as a contractor who should really be hired as an employee. Uh, is the company liable to cover both the employer payroll tax as well as the employee payroll tax that should have been deducted? And is there a penalty on top of that? So I'm not sure what debate the questioner is referring to, but um, the, the employer is definitely responsible for any penalties associated with mischaracterizing an employee as an independent contractor. And um, both there's liability for the tax itself and then also penalties. So it's an important thing to get right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, 
Uh, so Kathleen has, uh, has been clear. She was referring to our, our advice about how to contact EDD about people who hadn't, about the employees who wouldn't come back. Uh, any suggestions on uh, that? Probably, I don't know if that's Cooper or, or Mike. Uh, Mike, if you're talking, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. Uh, what was that last question? I was actually so, uh, so this is come, question. come back to the question we had just a moment ago about the the, the employees who didn't come back. Yes. Uh, so I think she was talking about looking for advice on how to contact EDD about that. Um, you know, if you could grab the contact information on that, we can look into it. Yeah, and one one thing that this has come up before, and if you're on the EDD web page. There's a, there's a talk to us button, which uh, starts a chat process. And we've heard from a, a number of people on the, um, we've heard from a number of folks on the, um, on the system that uh, uh, in these before, that that's worked really well for actually managing to contact somebody. So you might be on the phone forever, but the chat process appears to work fairly well. Uh, so I, I would, we would recommend that. That seems to have worked for other people. Okay, um, another tax question. Okay, um, I don't know, not sure how this, if this is a, e, e, a PPP or a tax, but it says tax question. So it says a recurring theme is S Corp owners are not taking, quote, a reasonable salary, unquote, which impacts their ability to get PPP loans. In order to correct this oversight, many of the tax preparers were extremely reticent to amend the payroll and tax returns. Other than the unpaid FICA, other taxes and penalties, are there other any other considerations? Yeah, so, so Chris Horton would recommend that you talk to your tax professional about that because that's going to be um, a case by case, taking a look a little bit, a deeper dive at your, your overall financial situation and tax ramifications. And so that would be my advice is talking to your, your, your tax professional about that one. I, I totally agree with that advice. So, so the tax professional we've got here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that's uh, um, looking for any more tax, uh, any more legal ones. Don't see any, so I'm going to go back up towards the top and see who thought the, uh, um, we've done that one and that one. Okay, so um, well, one from Walter. If a small business owner owes state and federal taxes, is there a way to mitigate the penalty or interest charged? So this is another question to definitely talk to your tax preparer about. Um, there are reasonable cause waivers and um, administrative waivers. Uh, and if the IRS has made an error, obviously that might create a situation that um, would allow you to waive penalties. But, um, I think it really is a case by case basis. So you'll have to you'll have to talk to your individual advisors about it. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, I guess Chris, uh, this one might be quickly. Uh, can we please review the two items which determine if the easy form can be used? So, reviewing the two items if the easy form can be used. It's to do with them being a sole prop, and there was one other, wasn't there? I am drawing a blank on, I don't know that we even in this presentation brought up the EZ form, yeah. um, but I think if you're, um, my, my suggestion would be if you're going to take a look at using the EZ form versus um, the full form, you may want to talk to, so Mike, what do you think? Are they going to call in to us at Ask SBDC? to take a look at it and look at their particular situation to make a determination which form is gonna be the best? Yeah, I think that would be a good start. The other thing they could do would be to, if, if depending on the size of their bank, if they've got pretty good access to their bank, I'd call their lender. Um, otherwise, they're certainly welcome to call the Ask SBDC line and we can get somebody to you know, kind of walk through it with them. Yeah, I'm just not thinking, Alan, that there's just an overarching um, way to determine if 
the regular form or the EZ form is going to be ideal for someone to use. So yes, you can have an exploratory conversation with someone to look at the EZ form, but I think you really want to drill down with your financial institution and your particular situation and the loan that you took out and see which one's going to be the best to satisfy your forgiveness. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, so the one from Jazine, if we have to send employees home to quarantine, can that employee paycheck be paid with the PPP loan? Um, and I think there might be a better way of paying them. Might that be right, Cooper? Rather than PPP, you can get you can get there's a tax break on the from the, yeah someone some yeah, someone could, yeah there's um there's a tax credit available for those amounts that should entirely offset the cost, so you shouldn't need to use the PPP loan for it. Uh, but if you if you if you're needing to spend it for PPP reasons, uh, is that eligible for spending under PPP if they're an employee? Say it again, Alan. So if, if someone's been sent home for quarantine, if, if for some reason uh, you don't want to take use a tax credit, or you can't, I can't imagine what that might be, but they want to know if they maybe they are trying to make sure they can use their PPP funds, although they've now got the extended period, they shouldn't be a problem, should it? There shouldn't be a problem, no, now that you have a 24-week covered period. Yeah. yeah, that really would be covered under payroll expenses. You know, they include sick leave and severance under allowed exp payroll expenses. Okay, uh, and I'm looking at the time, it's 11.28. So we've got like one more, probably time for one more question. Um, the, okay, it's a long one. Of course it is. Uh, so it's about PPP. So so prop with no employees recently funded. To qualify for 100% forgiveness, what's the fastest way to pay themselves? Is it divide the PPP money by eight and transfer it from the business to a personal account every week for eight weeks? Well, it, it depends. Yeah, I was gonna say it depends on the amount. If they're at eight weeks or less, their limit's gonna be $15,000. So it really depends on the amount of PPP funds they got to determine what's the max they're gonna be able to take. Okay, and there was a couple of more parts of that. Um, what's the, what is the earliest week that they can send the payments for? Is it the week the payment is transferred? The personal account was the week that the lender said you're qualified for PPP. It's when the funds were dispersed in the account. Okay, great. Uh, it's, so I'm seeing 11.29. I'm not seeing, uh, well, there is, uh, there is, there is a follow-up question to Maureen. Uh, uh, the debate I meant in regards to independent contractors versus employees was the Uber drivers recently being categorized as employees. Oh, right. Independent contractors. Got it. If that ruling stands, how far back can the EDD and IRS go to recover payroll tax payments? Um, I, I don't know how that would really affect any individual person because, um, I mean, the IRS has had a 20 factor test to determine whether somebody is, um, an employee or an independent contractor for ages. So I don't know if it would really affect anybody outside of the context of a company like Uber, really. Okay. All right. Well, it's um, it's 11.30. So uh, it looks like we're, we've uh, come to the end of our allowed time. Uh, we'll be sending uh, anyone who's got unanswered questions uh, today for the, um, for the uh, finance team. Uh, we still keep up. Keep, please send those questions to loans at askSBDC.com uh, or, or give us a call on askSBDC.com and they will, uh, we have specialists waiting for you to answer those questions. Um, so I think that's all that remains is for me to say thank you very much to our colleagues at Case Force for joining us, Maureen and Kate and Cooper and Brett. Uh, thanks, Mike and Chris, uh, for helping us out. Um, and anybody else who was here that I didn't notice because <laughs> their screens are turned off. Uh, thank you all for your questions. Um, we've got a whole bunch of webinars coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, including one on um, uh, lease agreements that's tomorrow. There's a one on uh, a case study of COVID exposure. 
Um, and then there's some things on um, legal essentials for online businesses as well. Uh, you can find all of the information on all of those in on the SBDC network calendar. So have a look there. Um, other than that, thank you very much. Uh, today's Wednesday. We'll see you back uh, here on Monday. Um, take care, everybody. Keep safe. I know, everyone.